the simplicity of what they captured and how like you know when you see a picture of something recently i was watching a video and someone was looking at it and they're going just problems with this whole production look at this person look how clean their hands are look at the fact they're wearing a white shirt and it's completely spotlessly clean and you're gonna tell me that they're out there working on a farm that doesn't make sense and if you think about it like some of this stuff like maybe you notice and maybe you don't like how real does something have to be in order to pull you into it you know there's such a thing as the ugly crying with the snot coming out of your nose and all that stuff on tv when they do the ugly cry and it's like okay like ugh, i don't want to see that even though it's realistic sometimes and so like sometimes it's really nice when they're like super realistic and other times i'm like okay you didn't have to get that realistic though so it's like this weird little balance and everybody's a little different about what is too realistic for them and what is not and what is necessary and what is not However, it's kind of funny how even if you don't entirely get it, how part of your brain understands when something has done a really good job of being realistic versus when they haven't. And when I say that Bronze Door captured something crucial, not just about the characters, not just about the story, they did such an amazing job of filming the whole thing. There were several times, like, I mean, there's places where they could have done it better, I'm sure. There always is. Nothing is perfect. And a lot of it is subjective where it's just me that would have liked that differently or not but just as one example because there's like so many things that I want to point out and so many places that I want to show you there's one in particular scene that like broke my heart that we're gonna get to later on it is a spoiler but this scene right here the way this scene was done I cannot believe how many times Wujie gets blown up by a hand grenade in this one like seriously but this time right here where it's like the realistic of it, I have never been blown up by a grenade you probably haven't either. That's not a common thing. But at the same time, I've seen kind of enough and heard kind of enough and I can kind of figure out enough that his reaction here makes perfect sense. I don't know what the correct reaction is. But there's something about the way that he did this one here that I just love it. How he's just like sitting there like in a complete daze. And then like he goes, huh? Yeah. Like his ears are not working because he just had this grenade blow up right beside him. So his ears are probably all plugged up and he can't hear properly. <laughs> I love it. The way it's just so simple. No fuss about it. It's just down to earth. It just pulls you right in there. <laughs> it's like, wait, what? They don't have to say anything or do anything. At first, you might think, what is he sitting there in a daze for? And then he's like, oh, oh. and you're like, oh, it's your turn. <laughs> well, yeah, because he just about got blown out by a grenade. But it's also, it's also scenes like this one. Like, the priority of what they're focusing on and when they're focusing on it and why they're focusing on it. Sometimes I'm watching a drama and I'm like, how is this not your priority right now? What are you doing talking about this? Why is this what you're thinking about? Isn't this, like, the huge factor? Like, you walked into the room because of this and all of a sudden it's like this and this and this. And you're like, oh, yeah, and also this. And I'm like, what do you mean, oh, yeah, also this? This is literally what you walked into the room for. And it, like, got anime is really bad for this somebody's about to die we have to go rescue them and then they have like three episodes of absolutely nothing to do with anything and i'm like would you please get back to the fact that he's dying and i'm talking really fast now and i'm sorry i hope you can keep up slow me down if i'm talking way too fast for you i'm trying to get this all out they whiplash back and forth between two different moods where there's something super serious and super urgent and it's like somebody's life is on the line and they're getting tortured or they're getting like they're in a super dangerous situation or something and it's all tense and it's getting on and then they flip over here to some like relaxed whatever or some kind of comedic scene between two people that are like so supportive um not even support characters anywhere because a support character is supposed to be supporting the story, isn't he? Or else the, the main characters of it. And sometimes these support characters are not very supportive. They're completely distracting. Or while we're in the middle of this and I'm like, would you go away and finish, wrap up this? I can't handle this. Back to, what was I saying? Which scene was I talking about there? Ah, the, the priorities of what you're thinking of and why you're thinking of it. When his arm here is dislocated and Fatty is supposed to fix it and he's like, distract me somehow. And what he says and... <laughs> And Wujie looks right at him and Fatty's like, uh. And he says something else that completely distracts Wujie and he fixes his arm. And then it's, he's like moving his arm around and then he suddenly, whop, <laughs> smacks Fatty. And Fatty's like, what was that for? And Wujie comments on what Fatty commented on. It's like, do you really do that? And Fatty's like, <laughs> <laughs> the realisticness of it. Like, it doesn't feel scripted so much as it feels just completely natural. And this is something super important that most dramas these days, I try not to exaggerate or generalize, okay? A lot of dramas these days, that's my problem with them, is that they lost this. The natural sense of this is just happening. 
And there's also a few places where, like I said before, about communication, like in Love of Nirvana, where they don't communicate to you these kinds of things sometimes. Like a lot of stories, a lot of stories these days. Stupid dramas that are like teen fiction, and it's like insulting to teens, and it's insulting to me, and it's insulting to everybody, and yet, what else am I supposed to call it? Crap, now I lost it. Not priorities, but the other thing, like explaining to me... Shoot, I totally lost it. I cannot remember what I was saying. There's the two things. Mm -mm -mm -mm. I have lost it. Well, sorry. But you know what I mean. Where it's like, you need to explain this to me somehow. Oh, where something happens and I don't necessarily understand why it happened that way. Like the mind reader thing. There's more than once in this drama where something happens and I'm a little confused about it. I'm like, but... But then the next thing they do is tell you why. Like this one instant, something happens and I'm like, but why did that... Why? Why? And then, like, she literally says something that's like, oh, okay, that's your... In that instance, it kind of felt a little bit like an excuse, but at the same time, she literally tells you, without telling me the audience, she just says it, like the other characters are wondering about it, so she says it. Also, throughout this entire drama, constantly, at a regular basis, Fatty is making comments or saying things, and I'm like, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Me, the audience, just, I'm, I'm like... And Fatty says it, and I'm like, oh, thanks, Fatty. <laughs> it's like, Fatty is me, the audience. And yet, like, like he's there in real time. He's there. Ugh, Harold. Pah, stupid cat. Pah, pah. He's there in the moment with them. And yet, this is what makes me feel like I'm also there. Because the characters are saying and doing what I would have done. This is something glorious that needs to be in dramas more often. If you want me to really connect to your story and love your story and all of this stuff, how do you pull the audience in? What is it that's making me connect to you? Well, the feeling like I'm literally right there because one of the characters keeps saying and doing everything that I would have said or done. Just random throwaway comments where it's like, well, that was a coin. And as in the middle of me saying that, Fatty goes, that was a coincidence. I'm like, okay, we all know it. We're all on the same page here. Good. So, more overall thoughts, talking super fast, gotta slow that down in order to understand what on earth I'm saying. Sorry if I'm talking way too fast for you, but I do not have much time and I want to get some of this up. I recorded stuff about this before and then I deleted it all because it felt very messy and all over the place and yeah, and now, sorry, it's kind of turning on to that all over again. I cannot believe I've already been talking for 11 minutes. I was talking that fast and yet I still used 11 minutes to say all that. So, I did a quick overview thingy of this already. It was 15 minutes. I love talking about stuff. If you don't like me rambling on and on and on, um, sorry. Maybe that's why very few people actually watch my channel is because I ramble on and on and on about stuff that I love or stuff that I hate. Sorry, that habit's never going to change. I try to organize it. I wanted to break this down just a little bit. Things that I absolutely loved and things that I didn't like very well and all of this stuff and how it's related to the book and going back to the books is always important. Some of the stuff that I didn't like is due to a change from the book to the show. A lot of it, I liked the show because of the change. Like, you have to remember, the book was not finished. The author left that book hanging. So there are certain things I have no idea where he was planning to go, but since he's the one producing this drama... It must have gone in the direction he was intending. It had to have if he was the one that was doing it. So, is this where the book was originally going? Feels more like he changed his mind just a little bit and tweaked it. But, there's also elements of it that actually could have been where the book was going because it stopped. Okay, I wanted to say, just because this is in the middle of everything, I wanted to do a quick breakdown on some of the characters and then actually break down the story. The main characters that are in this thing. Wujie. He's never been higher than maybe the fifth favorite character. There are things about Ujie that I really like, and there are things that I should probably like a little more, because he's actually pretty courageous. He is very stubborn. Like, he's stubborn in really bad ways, and he's also stubborn in really good ways. And sometimes it's hard to distinguish which is happening here. I have been stubborn in the past, but I got hurt like ten times worse because of it. It was a mess. Total mess. But that's something I've done before, and so I get that. And, like, that's the same kind of thing that Ujie is doing, where it's like he latched on to Chiling and he did not want to let him go. And it's like, and he latched on to this whole mystery. And because of his Uncle Three, he has a very, very, his loyalty to almost a detrimental level. Because, like, first of all, he went off on this whole incredible thing and it was all about Uncle Three. And then he finally is starting to maybe sort of kind of let go of Uncle Three a little bit. And what does he do? Replace him with Chiling. Now he just won't let go of Chiling and all of this stuff. And it's like, this is kind of unhealthy, Wujie. But, uh, so, I do like Wujie, but he's not an extremely favorite character. Uh, my favorite characters, who my favorite characters are, is different when you're talking about the books versus the dramas. 
because for instance Jiaohua. I adore Zhao in the books. I cannot stop talking about how amazingly epically cool Zhao is in the books. I don't know entirely why, but seriously, I adore that guy to the point of possibly putting him on some kind of pedestal. And therefore, because I adore him so much, I am like beyond furious words cannot describe how angry and upset I am that he is so, so, so badly portrayed in the dramas. Like, Lost Tomb to the actor that played him in there, I actually liked that Zhao Hua. Even that actor wasn't quite right, but he was probably still the closest to what Zhao Hua was like. But everybody in that, hmm, this actor right here that played in the movie and did a brief appearance of Zhao Hua in Bronze Door, I was so excited when I found out it was him and then he was only in it for like this much. I thought he was going to be in it. He should have been in episode 31 and we'll get back to that. He wasn't, but he should have been. But... Okay. This actor is the closest so far. I don't know what would happen if an entire drama was made with him playing Zhao Hua. I don't know if he'd be able to stick to how good Zhao Hua was in the books. How epic Zhao Hua is. He keeps getting deleted from the dramas. Nah, you man, you dropped that ball. And so many of the seasons have dropped the ball. And that's why I say this one was so good. Because they actually surprised me certain things that they added. Instead of dropping the ball, they didn't even just carry it. They actually like started juggling with it and were the best epic juggler I've ever seen. Oh, no, it was good. So, moving on from Zhao Hua, because he isn't even really in this one, Fatty. Unfortunately, if there was ten favorite characters, I don't even know if I have ten favorite characters. From either one. If you combine both, maybe I have ten. But if you take just the books, I don't think I have ten favorites. If you take just the drama, I might. I'm not sure. But, Fatty, if there was a top ten, he'd be number ten. There's something about Fatty, there's things about him that are really cool. His loyalty and his friendship and his dedication and all of this stuff. And sometimes he's really smart. And sometimes what he did, like everybody said, like there are so many things. Like he's that type of friend that's just so supportive and so encouraging and so there for you that there's a lot of things. Bougie would not have survived so many things if it wasn't for Fatty. It's so necessary for Fatty to be there because that's the kind of character that he is. So like all of that is epic about him. But at the same time, he's also got a sense of humor and some other stuff that I'm like... Okay, this is getting, this must be like male humor or something where it's just, I can't get behind Fatty right now. <laughs> it's And it's to the degree that not only do I not like him, there are occasions where I actually dislike him. It's like, Fatty, please go away right now. I, I, I can't with you right now. And then there's Sheeling, who I've always absolutely adored. But of course, like, as much as I adore him, uh, depending who he's with, the scenes get just a little bit boring. Did I really need to go back and see all of that? I don't think so. There was maybe more. And it was probably because people want to see Chi Ling. So you have to have something that Chi Ling is in. So you like have this kind of thing. So it kind of me. He used to be like my number one favorite character. Zhao Hua actually kind of knocked him off that pedestal. <laughs> They're either completely tied or Zhao Hua is actually above Chi Ling. And then who else is there within this one? I mean there's Feng and there's Hans. That are kind of like, um, there's something about when you have the foreigners in a Chinese drama, there's something about it that always slightly, they just don't seem to quite fit. And I'm not sure why. It's just kind of weird. In the books, by the way, these guys were German. I don't understand why they started calling them Dinaji. I'm like, what the heck is Dinaji? I looked that up and tried to find out what it is. And it's like a made up word. What is Dinaji? But I didn't really like Hans, obviously, for multiple reasons. I didn't really like him. Fung was okay, and I probably should have liked him more than I did. He literally, in this scene right here, why did he even do that? That actually feels completely 100% out of character. And I'm sorry if this is a little bit of a spoiler. But he's not like this anywhere else in the drama. I felt like he was one of the not-so-well-done characters because of that. Mm. Uh, commenting on the language used, by the way, so many of the Chinese dramas, they're just like... I'm sure I'm the same way. Where if I don't know the language quite as well or whatever, I try to put it in my books and it's like anybody that didn't, does know that language is probably like, this is the most awkward thing I've ever heard in my life. It's terrible. Why did you do that? It's, it's even worse than Google Translate. Like, what the crap? There's so much wrong with this. Some of them, I'm like, this is so intensely cringe. It's not even funny. For one thing, some of them, it's like, this is clearly a Chinese person that, that English was their second language and they've got a super heavy Chinese accent. And then they're trying to play the English character. He, like, literally came from England, and yet his Chinese is perfect, but his English is all, like, super heavily accented. And I'm like, consistency with your characters. There's nothing wrong with having a Chinese accent, but when you're supposed to be an English-born person with English as your first language, this should not be a thing. So it's really distracting. 
But then even when they get somebody that doesn't have that incredibly heavy accent, the lines they use, I'm like, this is really awkward English. Like, the wording, the way they word it, and what words they use and all this stuff, I'm like, this is the most cringy awkward thing ever. But in this one, there were a few lines that I was like, what? <laughs> But for the most part, it was actually really well done. They actually, for the most part, did a pretty good job. Most of the lines and stuff, it made sense. And just as important is when they use it. All you're doing is trying to remind me that they know this other language or something. Because that was not natural. That's not when you would have switched. That's not when you would have used it. That's not how you would have used it. It's so awkward. But in this one, the times that they switched back and forth, who they were talking to and why they used which language... For the most part, from what I remember, it made sense. And that, like, you know, pulls you into the story. And it's, like, one of those things where it's, like, like I say, I have a problem with that, too. So it's not necessarily, like, something that I can incredibly fault them for. But at the same time, it's something just to keep in mind. It makes it even better when you have more than one language and you use them both properly. It's, like, yeah. So, uh, that was really cool that they did. Now, that was all more generalized things. And I was supposed to be talking about the characters. But at the same time... What are the characters that can I talk about? The only other characters that I can talk about are Haiku and Haijiang and Yui and Yan. And I, I think for them, for the most part, I want to talk about them while talking about the story because a lot of things that I want to say about them might be considered spoilers. Or definitely would be considered spoilers. These four, by the way, are the main ones as well as Fung and Hans. These ones are the ones that are not in any other TV series. The part that I am positive, I'm like 90% positive that there's a section of the story from earlier that that was haiku. However, that part of the story was not put that, like, there's no TV series covering that part. It's not in any TV drama. They never got to that part. They never did it. Now, maybe get back to this, but, like, so haiku has never been in the story before. Yeah, anyway, so... Getting into the breakdown of those characters and this story in specifics and all the rest of that and other stuff that I wanted to say about it. What I did and what I did not like about all the different sections of this story. And you could say, and be probably accurate, that I'm kind of coming at this from the angle that if you read the book, should you bother watching the drama? Because there are so many people, right off the bat, within the first episode you might end up dropping this one because you might be really mad at it and really disappointed and whatever i saw a comment by someone that basically kind of said that where they're struggling to get into it because of what they did in the first episode and i'm arguing that you should still stick with it and watch it because there's so much about this one that is so epic and it's because i love the books that i'm saying that i love the books and because i love the books and i love the characters this drama is worth watching this season is worth watching so coming at this like this um the first episode what is wrong with the first episode <laughs> well <laughs> like i said my video that i said is to bridge the gap to bridge the you know what i'm trying to say bridging the gap it took me like an hour to talk about this and that was a really brief really quick skim over of everything that happened and yet it took me an hour and yet it took this drama maybe 20 minutes. I think it was closer to 15. I keep forgetting to actually check. I was like, mind blown. The funny thing is, I started watching this one and I was laughing. I do not know why. Still, I don't quite understand why I was laughing so hard. Middle of the night and I'm laughing so hard that I'm like, I hope I don't wake my sister up. It was so funny to me watching that thing. I was laughing so hard. And I think part of the reason why I was laughing so hard, there's two reasons why I am okay, even though I'm not okay with the fact they skimmed over that so fast, because I loved the Zhang family tomb section of the books. There was so much in there, but at the same time, there's two reasons why I was laughing and why I'm maybe kind of, you could say, three reasons why I'm okay with the fact that they skimmed over all of that so fast. Okay, reason number one, I gave you my thoughts on Wujie and Fatty. Neither one of them is my favorite kind, my favorite character. They're maybe number five and number ten on my list. Maybe. So when it's just those two, when stuff is happening and it's just those two, there's an element of it that I really like. Because, like, those two together are hilarious. And this scene right here was done so epically well. Oh, those two. The chemistry of. This is one of my favorite things about so many of these seasons and stuff. Even if that specific 
actor didn't necessarily capture that specific character very well, somehow all of them have managed to capture the relationship between the duo and the trio. I don't know, is this like just a regular thing between male friends? Like, it's just, this is how it's always, how is that so much easier to capture than the character by themselves? I don't know. I am rambling. No, reason number one, the more often I watch it, the more likely I am to start skipping through it because like, <sighs> There's the, the, the comedic aspect, and there's, the, like, that scene right there. That is exactly how it was like in the book, I'm pretty sure. There was something to do with all of that that was, and I'm like, but yeah. Whether it's the same as the book or not, I just am not interested in watching people pull their own teeth out. Mm. So, <laughs> well, this is hilarious, and while it's very, very much like these two, it's like, even the first time that I'm watching it, I'm like, skip just a little bit, because I'm like, mm. <laughs> So this is what it's like when it's Fatty and Mugier. Sometimes, like, they're really funny, but they also have a certain sense of humor or the, the way that they handle certain things and stuff. I'm like, men. <laughs> so, most of the Zhang family tomb was only Fatty and Mugier. So, am I okay with the fact that they skimmed over it really fast and didn't show most of it because of that? Yeah. Especially because later on in this drama, the way they did it, there were several times that it was only Mugier and Fatty. So, I already had tons of scenes that was only them. I didn't necessarily need this one as well. Reason number two, and I think I was laughing so hard partially because, despite the fact that they skimmed over it so fast, they somehow still managed to capture the majority of the most important feel of the Zhang family tomb. You could almost call them Easter eggs. There are so many things that they pointed out or managed to show you or portray that if you've read the book, you're like, I remember that and everything that went on with that. They managed to catch this stuff. And then they like made like a tiny little like the fire, okay? The fire that was yay and fatties in the book, the way it was described, I'm like, there is literally no way that the two of them, they had no water, they had no fire extinguisher. There's no way they actually would have been able to put that fire out. The way it was described, the fire was too big. In the drama, the fire, they had the fire. He stuck the fire in there. How did you manage to stick the fire in there? But more importantly, the fire was much more manageable. It was way smaller. It made more sense. They were able to literally just stomp it out. It literally made more sense. But it captured the fact that they set the place on fire. It wasn't the same type of place. I don't know if that's a family-friendly TV thing in the books. There's literally, like, the coffins. This is a tomb. There's literally coffins. But in the drama, they don't show you any coffins. They just show you some scrolls, and it was out there in the hallway that there was a fire. It wasn't even the scrolls that they set on fire. So it's, uh, mm, family-friendly TV. I don't know. So that's reason number two that I'm probably okay with the fact they skimmed over it. Because they still managed to capture some of the most important feel. If you're paying attention and if you realize... Point number three, and like factor all of this in there, it is a disappointment that they skimmed over it so fast. But on the other hand, moving on to point three, I kind of understand why he skimmed on it so fast. Because there was literally so much that happened within the Zhang family tomb. They literally could have spent like six, seven, eight episodes. This is part of my problem. They should have put it into ultimate note. Instead of going into the tomb and instead of properly doing justice to the actual tomb, they spent a whole bunch of time on this fake training ground place and that made me really mad for multiple reasons one they completely changed granny hulo's character because in the book i actually had a lot of respect for her and i actually kind of liked her despite not liking her because she's so arrogant and she's one of the mystic nines and it's hard to like any of them because they're also arrogant and self-centered and all the rest of this kind of stuff but i actually did kind of like granny hulo in the book because even though she's all of that stuff she did come across in the books as somebody that was like you know she kept her word she actually said that's why she didn't like i think it was the Wu family because they don't keep their word she is very strong on keeping her word keeping her promises etc being honest all of this stuff that's more like what granny hulo is but because of what she did in the end of ultimate note sticking them in there and all of this stuff she broke her promise she went against her word she changed what she said and i'm like are you kidding me you totally changed granny hulo doing this that made me really mad but it also i'm like 
They never made it into that tomb before. They had no way of knowing that all of that was in there or that it was like that. They had the blueprints, yes. Therefore, they had the foundation, yes. They did not have what was actually in there. The way that the drama portrayed it, somehow, they did know it. Nobody should know that stuff. But now, because they did that, what's the point of going to the real family tomb now? There's kind of no point because this would just be a repeat. So I understand why, and more importantly, um, personally, this is just a personal idea, a theory, because I don't actually know the author, but a theory is the author's mind by this point, his world is so big, his mind is over here. He's thinking about this stuff. This is what he's writing right now. This is what he's thinking about. This is what he's planning on making into a TV show right now. His mind is not on the Zhang family tomb anymore. This section of his story, he's been done with for several years already, right? So it, as like for me myself, when I try to go back, if I have a series of something, if I keep trying to go back over here and fix this and make it work, when my brain is over here and I want to be writing about this, it's really hard to do that. And to do it in a way that's going to do it justice. Because basically you want to skim past it because you're tired of going back there. You want to get over here. This entire drama, there's more than one spot. There's here, there's episode 31, and there's episode 32. Like, the way that they did this whole thing, there are several sections where I'm like, okay, I feel like he's skimming past this because he wants to bridge the gap here. He wants to make Bronze Door and go on with it because he wants to be over there right now. That's where his focus is. He's tired of being over here, but he knows he needs this. And this is why, in a sense, I'm forgiving of him, forgiving to word him for, like, not doing it justice in a way, but at the same time, he still managed to do it justice. This is the probably the only one I can think of that's done this, where they skimmed by it so fast, and yet they still managed to capture enough of what was really important in my mind. Maybe not everybody will agree with this, but that's how I see it. In my mind, they still managed to grasp enough of it and had the feel of enough of it that that was the most important aspects of it and you still managed to grasp that despite how fast you were going that okay i can be a little more forgiving and for some reason i can't stop laughing still even the second time around i'm like <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> so there's that and i still like have to giggle and laugh and i can't believe that they that, that they stuck xiaohua and juju in there and like anybody that hasn't read the books Anybody that came straight from Ultimate Notes is like, why is Zhao Hua in pajamas sitting up in the bed? What's going on here? The connecting dots. Like I say, the author is the one that keeps going back to the book, people. It's not my fault. He keeps going back to the book. Because they still skipped stuff. As fast as they were skimming over stuff, they still skipped stuff. They didn't explain to you at the end of Ultimate Note, Zhao Hua is perfectly fine. So how did he end up in pajamas in a hospital bed? You gotta go back to the book to find out why. And I told you in the bridge to bridge the gap, I told you what happened with Xiao Hua. So, despite the fact that Bronze Door is out, that video that I made is still valuable. So feel free to go back and watch it. Just ignore what I said about Tibetan Sea Flower and go watch Bronze Door instead. But everything that I told you about the Zhang family tomb is still important because they skimmed by it even faster than I did, and I was skimming pretty fast. So, that was my thoughts about the first episode. <laughs> Just leave before I chase you off. <laughs> Okay, was there anything else about that whole stuff? Yeah, the whole setup of how um, Wujie heads off to Tibet and how he finds the retreat center and the whole town and all painting and all of that stuff. Literally everything about that. Finding the room, having the scrolls. The only thing is the guy that was giving him the scrolls. Some of that sounds very familiar, but other people said they couldn't remember him from the book. But at the same time, something about him just felt too familiar, like he was based on something. And no, I didn't go back and skim the book because it's hard to go back and skim that book because despite the fact it's not finished, it was fairly long. All of every, all of that setup and everything, and even including how the adventurers showed up and how some of them were hikers, the Naji people, the Zhang family, all of that is basically exactly the same as in the book. It comes almost straight out of it. Like, it is so, so, so similar. And when I was reading the book, I was getting a tad bit bored because I always do when it's only Wujie or, like, when it's only Wujie, it's even more boring than when it's only Wujie and Fatty, because at least, like, they're playing off each other, and it's like, yeah. Anyway, so, there's all of that stuff that was happening. And then, one of my favorite things about this drama is the fact that they fleshed out the Scorpion Tomb. I was so hoping that they would put that in there, and they did, and I was so excited and happy. In the book, the Scorpion Tomb, you hear all about it. Like, they go back there. However, 
they stop it at this point here. The scroll only tells Bougier this much of it. And then, this is one thing that they changed that at first it bothered me quite a lot. By the end of the drama, everything they do, it maybe doesn't bother me as much because they clearly changed Haiku. The author clearly changed him. And I will get into that in a little bit, but that is a spoiler. So I was kind of saving it. Not quite yet. The point is, in the, it's like he read this in the scroll and then you find out the rest of the story. But even when you find out the rest of the story in the tomb, you find out up to the point where Chi Ling saves them, but you don't find out how he did it. And you don't find out the rest of the story. It's just, it's not in the book. So in the drama, they complete the entire story. They go ahead and show you Chi Ling saving them and how he did it. And they go ahead and show you all the rest of the stuff. So like they completed and finished the story. And I'm like, yes, that's like literally there's two parts of this drama that were my favorite parts of the drama that I could watch over and over and over again. And I'm like hooked and watching it the whole way through. The Scorpion Tomb is one of them. I love the way they did that whole thing. This is another thing they changed in there is the fact that they put Hai Jiang into it. Because I actually forgot. That's one thing I did go back to the book and I did skim a little bit. Hai Ke and Shi Ling alone. Just the two of them went off to start their wilding. It was only the two of them because, um, and this is, this is, yeah, they changed the ages, by the way. I don't know what age they're claiming they are in the drama. They're using adults to play them, but they never actually specify exactly how old they're supposed to be. They do this all the time. They use adults to play characters that are supposed to be like 16 even. So I don't know how old they were claiming they were supposed to be, but even if they claim that they were 16, they're aging them up. Because in the book, they said that the Zhang family go out onto the wildings when they're 15. Hai Ke. See, that's one of the reasons when they changed it, they put Hai Jiang in there. She wasn't part of that in the book. And that would be why. If they're supposed to go out when they're 15, Hai Jiang and, ha and Hai Ke are not twins. So she wouldn't have been 15 yet, so she wouldn't have gone on her wilding yet because they're supposed to be 15 to go on their wilding. She probably would have been closer to 13 or something. And that's the thing about Chi Ling. Chi Ling was 13 in the book. 13 when he went on this whole scorpion adventure to him. 13. And he was very, very small for his age. So he probably looked even younger than 13. But he was supposed to be 13. And Haika and the others were supposed to be 15. So Haika felt bad for Chi Ling and was worried about him and whatnot. He had only ever met him once before that in his life. He said so in the book. So just the two of them went out. And along the way, they met up with three others, three other guys. And they joined forces to become the five that went to the Scorpion Tomb. That's how it happened in the book. In the drama, I'm actually okay with the change because it fit with the flow of caring about these characters. Hai Zheng, she comes into the story of Tibetan Sea Flower as an adult. You don't know anything else. She's just, she's an adult that walks on the screen. And all you know is that she's a Zhang and that she's the sister of Hai Ke. So it's harder to connect with her character and harder to care about her character and whatever. In the drama, they went back and they changed it so that all five of them left together and they changed it so that Hai Zheng was there. So you're watching the whole Scorpion Tomb and you are connecting with Hai Zheng. You are getting to understand her, what she's like, what her relationship with Hai Ke is like, what her relationship with the other two is like, what her relationship with Chi Ling was like. It builds it. Because they added her back there, it's actually a key and really important that they did that. And I'm actually really glad that they did it. At first, I was not because I was like, here we go. We have to add the girl in. It can't just be the five. You have to put a female in there. And it was like all a part of the agenda of these days and all the rest of that. But that's not what was happening. It's like so important for the building of everything that she was there in the Scorpion Tomb that you get to see that. So there's several things that they changed. And the vast majority of it, I actually liked. What I didn't like so much... My one complaint right off the bat was the fact that it wasn't Hai Ke that told Wu Jie the rest of the story. In the drama, getting into this a little bit, in the drama, Hai Ke doesn't tell Wu Jie anything about his personal experience with Chi Ling until way later. And it's not even Hai Ke that tells him. Way later. <laughs> even more of a spoiler right there. But right off the bat in the book, it was Hai Ke that finished the Scorpion Tomb story. Hai Ke actually told Wu Jie quite a bit. Before they went off to the snowy mountain, like right away, Haika actually told him quite a bit. Like the scrolls in the book, most of it, like it was right here. I think they brought them a few scrolls that weren't in that room, but most of it was right here and it was done with the scrolls. The rest of it, there was no more scrolls. The scrolls stopped coming into it. In the drama, that was a little 
bit of a coincidence, especially when he kept finding them in the correct order. I'm like, this is getting a little ridiculous because we need to keep going to the past. We want to see all that stuff that happened back then and what way to do it in a flow. You don't want to see it out of order. You need to see it in correct order. So therefore, he has to coincidentally, if you're going to claim that he keeps getting all of this from scrolls instead of people or whatever, you have to coincidentally always get them in the correct order and they have to keep coming. So it becomes increasingly coincidental and increasingly ridiculous and like, um, <laughs> it wouldn't, seriously, that, no way. Like one single scroll survives later and it just happens to be the one that he needs on top of it being the one single scroll that survives. And you're like, really? Really? But fine, we'll let it slide. In the books, it made more sense, like say, because he was finished with the scrolls and whatever. And then Haika was the one that told him. And this is the one thing, even if I let it slide with the coincidental of the scrolls, the one thing that I don't want to let slide because it actually was kind of annoying. Wujier says with his own mouth more than once that he wants so much to know about Chilin's past and everything that happens that he will not let slide any opportunity to find out about it. He is going to pursue, even if there's only a glimmer of a slim little chance of a hope that he might find out something about Chi Ling's past, he is going to pursue that hope and he is going to, like, find out. No matter how slim of the chance it is that it's real or that he's going to find anything out, he is going to go after it. And yet, Haikun Haijing, he already read the scroll and knows that it's them that were there in the scorpion tomb with Chi Ling, and yet he never once asks them. Until way later over here, he kind of sort of asks them once and then lets it drop. He doesn't ask them about Chi Ling. They were clearly there. And yet he continues, like, he, because he keeps getting it from the scrolls instead and whatever, even between scrolls, he doesn't ask them. He doesn't say, so, you were there and I want to know about Chi Ling's past. What do you know about his past? He doesn't ever ask them. Why? He's the one that said he's not going to let any opportunity pass. There's an opportunity right in front of you. Haika is right there in front of you. And yet you don't ask him. That's very, very contradictory. Like, extremely contradictory. Little bit of a ball drop right there. But like I say, in the book, Haika was telling him. It was in order to build the trust with him. That's how he built trust with him. Was telling him about this stuff. Proving that he does know Chi Ling and that he did know something about him. That was literally the building of trust right there in order to convince him to come along with them and help them and all that stuff. And they deleted that and changed it and made other stuff happen instead in the drama. The way they ended up changing it, I suppose by the end of the drama, I'm, I, I guess, I understand. Like, because that's the thing. Okay, fine. I'll start talking about Haiku's character here. Haiku's character changed quite a lot from the books to the drama. I only sort of skimmed a little bit of Tibetan Sea Flower but I did go back and skim over more heavily the other side stories. Haiko's character in the book is actually very similar to Haiyan. If you've only seen the drama so far, you do not have a clue who Haiyan is. Eventually, if this thing ever releases, you will know Haiyan. But as of this moment, Haiyan is not in any TV series. He's only in the book. However, there's Chilang, Haiyan, Jishan, and then a little bit lower is Haiko are the four Zhang family members that you actually really properly get to know in the books. Most of the others is kind of a skim over and you, there's a little bit of whatever and then they kind of like disappear for whatever reason. Even Rishan in the book. Surprisingly, it's a t completely different lieutenant that you first are hearing about and then as it moves into more just the Zhangs because this original lieutenant that you're finding out is not a Zhang. So it moves into more what the Zhangs you're doing and at that point, you start hearing more about Rishan in the book and what he's like. And he is incredible in the book. In like, the drama, Mystic Nine dropped the ball on him so badly. They dropped the ball so badly on the whole Zhang family. But um, you get to know more about him, but then the story stops. So you don't actually, in the book, you don't know what happened to Rishan. You don't know if he survives or not because in the book, he, his life is currently in danger. The, he, he went missing. <laughs> I loved Jishan's reaction in the book. He finds out that Rishan is missing and instantly he's like, gotta go find Rishan right now. Because the Zhang, the people that came with him, his young people that came with him and Rishan are so important to him. But that's off onto the wrong thing. What was I saying? Um, 
Haiku in the books, actually, when I'm reading the book, when I skim over it and look at what he's like, actually, he's surprisingly very similar to Haiyan. And, like, <laughs> because you don't know anything about Haiyan, you don't really understand what that means. Haiyan is a lot more, like, fatty and, like, a few other people that, like, he is way out there. He's so way out there. Haiyan is just way out there. And Haiku is actually, from skimming over the, 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 the books and stuff of what Haiku is like, he's actually a lot more like Haiyan. But within the drama, he's totally not. He's like the opposite of Haiyan. Totally the opposite of Haiyan. So they completely changed his character as far as I'm concerned. In a sense, this is, the, this is, this is what kind of bothered me when I'm reading all the other stuff. It's like... How do you connect this now? Because everything is happening over here. Can that still happen after everything that happens over here? I'm not sure. Some of it maybe could. Some of it you're going to have to tweak it now before it's going to make any sense. Because this character's not like this anymore. So if your character's not like that, you're not going to be saying those things. You're not going to be doing those things. Not the same way. So it's going to change this. And that kind of bothers me. In an, in, but in another way, because they made his character so strongly this way in the drama... I'm okay with it. Like, I absolutely adored Haika. He is my absolute favorite character within this drama for more than one reason. He's totally a character type of mine. Um, the fact that it's like, it's got the brother and sister relationship and them playing off each other and all of this kind of stuff. Like, I am so instantly drawn to that because of me and my older brother. Like, that's a thing for me. That's like right there for me. This is what I absolutely adore is portrayals of brother and sister that way their relationship i love it so much i i love it absolutely love it so much like that is my oh that is right there deep inside me oh but haiku the one thing that they changed the biggest thing that they changed from the book to the drama and this one does still bother me is what haiku looks like it would have been so cool if they had managed to find twins identical twins that are good at acting that could play haiku and Ujie in this one because Haiku is supposed to look exactly the same as Wujie at this point. The thing is, in the books, Haiku and what he looked like was part of something huge and complicated that the author still has not properly, I think way over here in, in stuff that comes after Sound of Providence, he's going into it more and bringing out more of it and all of this kind of stuff. He's touched on it several times, and but like it's still working through it and I don't understand it all and I feel like the author doesn't even understand it all. He's making it up as he's going and all of this kind of stuff. And the fact that Haiku looked exactly like Wujie was part of this bigger thing over here. And I don't know if the author has just decided to take Haka, Haiku straight out of that so that he's not involved in any of this and he's just completely changed him because the fact that he looked like Wujie is part of that. And in the drama, they made him not look like Wujie. So because he does not look like Wujie anymore, like in the drama, they say he put the mask on 20 years ago and now he cannot take the mask off. Zhao Hua said the same thing to Wujie when Wujie put the mask on to look like Uncle Three. Zhao Hua said, you can only keep it on for a certain amount of time and then you have to take it off. Because if you don't take it off, it's going to meld to your face and you no longer will be able to take it off. It'll be like you. You will forever have to wear that mask because you will not be able to take it off anymore because it melds right together with your own skin and melds right in there and it's there to stay. And that, in the books, is what they said happened to Haika. He put on the face mask to look like Wujie, and now he cannot take it off. That's what they said in the drama. But in the drama, it's like this setup that wasn't even true because he literally takes it off. And he can't do that in the book. He will forever and always look like Wujie. There's this quote in one of the side story, Southern Archives Extra, Zhang Haika and I, i.e. Wujie, were starting to look different. It was obvious that he hadn't been trying too hard to look like me for the past few years, but we still looked like brothers when we were together. He even looked a little younger than me. And that right there, the Southern Archives extras, from what I can see on the timeline, that happens way over here before Sound of Providence, but well after Sansi. It's in the Rain Village years. So, like, it was way over there that, ha that Haika looks like his brother, but not his identical brother anymore. At the point of Tibetan Sea Flower at Bronze Door, they're supposed to look identical to each other. And it's a little disappointing to me that he doesn't, because 
<laughs> is actually funny in the book. It's like a running joke every time Wujie sees him, and every time Haika does anything that Wujie doesn't like, or is slightly embarrassing, or is slightly weird, or anything like that, Wujie has a conniption because he's like, you look like me, and yet you're doing that. Ah, this is so insulting and embarrassing and horrible. And, <laughs> and it's like, hilarious but you can't have that anymore because Haika doesn't look like him anymore so it's like that actually sucks a little bit and going on and on and on about this there's so much more to say so done editing what I had before and continuing uh it's already like 45 minutes long but since nobody watches the videos anyway I don't care I'm just gonna keep on talking because I love the drama and I want to talk about it so so, the sewers and the old city section of this drama, um, plus the Zhang residence. This is one of my favorite parts of the whole drama. I said there was the two parts. The one of them is the scorpion tomb, and the other one is this part. I love how they did this part. The only part that was, eh, even the first time around, well, no, I think the first time around I tried to watch it like a good little girl. Second time around, it definitely didn't. Fung and Hans and all of them, as they're following behind in the sewers, don't care. I feel like I'm watching the same. I already watched somebody go through this. I don't want to watch another bunch of people go through this. Um, but the sewers in the old city part, I love this part of the drama because, like, it's just the four of them, Fatty and Wujie and Haika and Hai Jiang, and it's, like, simple, and yet it's, like, interesting. It's really fun and interesting. And a little bit of a spoiler for you, one of the things that makes this one extremely different from every other one you know, there's one part in this drama Wujie literally says, we always used to be able to save everybody before. I'm like, Wujie, you clearly haven't seen the drama. The dramas are obsessed with bringing along a ton of people and most of them die. Anyway, moving on. Um, in this one, you actually get to see two places, the Scorpion Tomb and here, where everybody that goes in comes back out alive. And you're like, oh. <laughs> anyway. Um, okay, what is it about these ones that made me love it? Well, there's that whole section. There's also the fact that, uh, like, it's the fun adventure of it. And you get to see Hai Jung and Hai Ke. You get to see some of their talent. Like, at one point, Fatty and his contradictory moves where he's like, Yeah, we don't need you, high cuts. Bouge that literally just saved your life just now. We don't need you. And yet there's so many times in this drama where he's like, Haika, you go in front. Or Hai Jin, cover me. Or whatever. I'm like, Fatty, you were so contradictory. You can't have it both ways, dude. <laughs> oh, massive eye roll. Um... But I love this whole section of it, and one of the, the things about it is, like, the Zhang residence, and you get to see the family, you get to see a group of Zhang family members, of ordinary Zhang family members, and what is like living an ordinary life. And you have Haika. Haika is so insightful. It is insane how insightful Haika is. Like... There's so much more to him that I want more of him. I swear. Like, I just, I want more of him. Because the more you get to see him through this drama, and the more times you watch through this drama, you realize the depths there are to this guy. Even though, like, I mean, they call him single-minded. But at one point, Wujie, I can't remember what he said all of his strengths were. One of them was, like, his flexibility, his, his ability to adapt to any situation. And it's so true. And you see that throughout the whole drama throughout the whole unfolding of the story you see how well he adapts to things and somebody else says that he's very single-minded <laughs> that's also true he is rather single-minded very much single goal oriented and he stays on track with it and is determined to finish it um but like you get to see the ordinary Zhangs and Haika there's so many places where he explains what's going on even though he claims he can't know it all, and that's true. What he does say, you're like, that makes so much sense. And it wouldn't have necessarily made sense coming from anybody else. But because he's also a Zhang, like, it just makes sense coming from him. Like, the way they think and how they think that and why they think that because of their long lives and all of this stuff. And then what it's like to have this as, like, the way you were raised and all this stuff. And then all of a sudden not to have it and ha expect to be ordinary. And how are you supposed to do that when nobody told you how to do that and stuff like this? It's like, in, 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 
insightful and in in depth and interesting and i really that's one of the things i appreciate the most in this drama is the communication the the, the the telling me the audience including me by explaining these things but not doing it in an unnatural way it's a very natural way this just it's so well done and the spoiler that i can't really explain because i don't want to spoil that much of it there's something that happens in the zhang family residence actually two things that i did not see coming one of them I did not see coming because something like that has never happened in the story before. Not once. I cannot remember a single time when that has happened in the books or in the dramas. Something happens in this section of the story that has never happened before. A certain character, something happens that... <laughs> and the way they set it up, the way they filmed that scene, oh my goodness! I was like, oh, <laughs> whoa! I was like frozen with my mouth a little bit open because I did not see that coming. I didn't expect the author to do that. Oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> and the way that they did it, the whole setup, the director's choices and how they filmed it and all that stuff, it was so well done. And you, if you've watched this drama, you will probably know where I'm talking about. It's in the Zhang family residence. And it's who it happened to. It's what happened. And it who did it? But then, like, following immediately right after that, there's the whole string of events that happens right there. And, like, the way they portrayed it, this is what I'm talking about. What does it take to bring Rougier from what he's like in Ultimate Note and what he was like all previous to that to what he is in Sansi? You start watching your Sansi and you're like, what happened to you? And they kind of start explaining later in Sansi. But, like, now you watch this one and you see this whole section, how they filmed it and what happened. I was like... <gasps> I mean, I knew from the books they said things that happened, and I understood it because of reading the books, but to actually see it, I didn't quite expect them to do it, or to do quite as well of a job, and like, it's, um, because of YouTube, whatever, I don't know if I can, like, stuff that happens... Uh, that's referred to, I can't remember if he actually says it in Sansi that he did that. Sansi got messed up when it was made into a drama, I swear. There is so much that was like, oh, in the book that didn't, like, you know, the stone statues in Sansi. When, when um, Lee Siu, I think his name is, gets sent a bunch of packages and in some of those packages there's stone statues. Those were not stone statues in the book. We'll just leave it there. It's like a lot of that kind of stuff was happening in Sansi, where it's like, that is, like, it was way more in the book, like, way more 18 plus in the book than it was in the drama. And there's a lot of this kind of stuff that was going on in these years for Bougier and everybody that's with him and stuff, trying to deal with the Wongs and all that. And, like, I didn't actually quite, like I say, they brought in... During this drama, they threaded together so many threads, and this is the kind of thing I'm talking about. They actually showed one of these events for Rouget, and I was like, oh, 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 and that's all in there. So, all of that was there, and I don't want to spoil absolutely everything that happens, so that's as much as I'll say about that. But there's also, during that time, um... Uh, now I don't know if I should say the name of what character it is. I said earlier, I said no, because I said there was one scene that was heartbreaking to me. Actually, no, sorry, there's two, and I said in a note, because there's two scenes. The one scene that I was first referring to when I said there's a heartbreaking scene that I'm going to get back to, I don't think I actually just about cried in it, but I was like, that is one of the best filmed scenes and acted scenes I have ever seen. But there's one other one that did, the first time I watched it, and the second time I watched it. It's closer to the end. It's part of this event, sort of, but it's like the wrap-up at the very end of this event. There is a character within this drama that dies. And when this character dies, I almost cried. Both times. Even the second time through this drama, when I was expecting it, I knew it was coming, I knew how it happened, I knew everything about it, and yet, even the second time, 
I am not somebody that likes flashbacks. If you've ever seen any of my other videos, you know how much I hate flashbacks. In both of these scenes that I'm talking about, there was a lot of flashbacks. And but the thing, both of them, I think maybe the death scene more so, they went a little bit too much. There was a little bit too much of flashbacks, but they actually did a pretty good job of not showing as much flashbacks or the type of flashbacks or something. The way they didn't, didn't, the way they did it did not irritate me quite as much as it usually does. They actually did uh, mostly, like, 80% a pretty good job, despite, like, even including the flashbacks, I should say. But yeah, even the second time around when I saw it coming, there's just something about the way that it happened. My throat got sore. Even the second time through, I almost cried. That was... Oh my gosh! That was so sad! And it was... I think part of the reason why I want to cry is because it was not just sad. It was so... Deep! There was something so deep about the way the character died and why the character died. And everything that character had been going through up to this point. And everything that character is feeling. And I'm feeling it too as they're dying. And I'm like... That was almost too well done. That was so well done. So that was all in there too. And that's another thing that added major points to this drama. I didn't expect a character to die. I didn't expect him to die that way. <laughs> uh, they're, they, after that is when they head into the snowy mountain. To actually go ahead with actually going towards the bronze door. After all this, they haven't even... Now you're starting to see why the, the adventure behind the bronze door title doesn't make sense to me. They're going into the snowy mountain. And here we go again. It's like in some of the other seasons. We have to watch them trekking through the snow again. Trek, trek, trek. Long, long, long journey. Laboring through the snow and cold. In high altitude, so they're all like breathing oxygen out of a can because they're running out of oxygen. And I'm like, hmm. my biggest problem with this part, like I said, like in the book during this part, there was like four people and that was it. So it was either four or five people. But like, this is why my big problem when they get to the lake and stuff happens, was you rescue somebody. And he did do that in the book too. But in the book, it was okay because there was like, Two people. One or two people. I think it was two people that he pulled off the ice. And he did not do it alone. Fatty helped him. But in the drama, not only does he do it alone, he does it alone twice. So he pulls two people, and then he pulls two more people from the middle of this big lake, all the way over to the edge of the lake, twice and i'm like spotlighting okay y you're d why is it only bougier doing this that was too much even if you're trying to make the point that like i mean okay that's one of his strengths is his ability to withstand hallucinations and all of that stuff and like they made a point to saying it's very rare that anybody can break through this illusion on their own and they said that in the book too this is a Wujie talent but this was taking it a little too far i felt like it was taking it a little too far i was a little bit annoyed that he pulled four people off the ice all by himself um so then you move into the whole like night king you start finding out what that actually is etc there's like um <clears throat> Yeah, it gets a little bit, this is where I was getting into the, you find out a theory and the theory is only partially correct. So you hear the theory over again as you're finding out the truth of it and all this stuff. And then you finally get, you know, further in there and start seeing the real adventure behind the bronze door. And you finally catch up to the part where this is the book ends. When it was like Guijie and Haijiang and Fatty and they were the only ones there. And in the drama... They pared it back down again. They had enough stuff happening and whatnot to pare it down to just those three again when they approached the bronze door. Except I feel like there was one other person there in the... Possibly. I don't remember for sure. But either way, it got back real close to the book again right there. And then it gets into all kinds of stuff that wasn't in the book. Um, except, I swear, maybe I should have skipped through the book after all. Because you you there's this whole Yin Shao... I think that's how I say it. In Shao Village, there's a whole part there, 
And it feels like even the fact that a storm was coming, I feel like that was in the book. But I feel like it came before they went to the bronze door. So help me out here. I probably should have checked that out. If you've read the book, tell me, was there a storm in the book with the village that Wujie helped save them from? But anyway, there's this whole section with the Yinshao village. And um, before I get to that, though, there's the, there is the heartbreaking scene. Now I feel like I'm skipping all back and forth and being confusing because I am trying to finish this. I'm filming this on a completely different day. I'm trying to get this done, and I don't want it to be like a million years longer. Um, there's the whole heartbreaking scene. And the thing is, it's who it is, and it's the actor's ability to the, the way that it was portrayed and done it was one of those things like I keep saying it's so simple they do not over through the roof high definition everything where it all must be perfect and it must be a beautified cry and all of this stuff it's so raw and so real like I was watching the scene going oh my word oh like I say I don't think I quite almost cried here but at the same time I'm like A little bit speechless. And the thing is, like I said earlier, with the believability of something and what it, I mean, like, I started out this whole thing by saying, like, you know, um, ugly crying and, like, the dirty shirt when versus a spotless shirt, a portrayal of something is realistic. I don't even know whether they did this on purpose or if they even realized they did it or what, but, like, Haiku's hair was perfectly normal and fine. And then he runs his hands through it, and for the rest of this whole scene, his hair is ruffled. Like, the realness of that aspect, as well as the symbolism of that aspect, because everything has changed here. Nothing is going to be the same again, and it's like, his hair is ruffled. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? The detail. I just had to point that out as another one of the examples of how well this drama did this, of drawing you in with the just details that you don't necessarily notice and yet your brain comprehends it as making sense. So, now, I have to move into stuff that's a lot more of a spoiler, like even that whole section there, I want to talk more about both of those heartbreaking scenes, but at the same time, I don't want to major, major spoil it for you. So in a sense, that was a little bit of a scheme over of some of the most important stuff. But at the same time, one probably major spoiler so like if you don't want to hear about this i guess i'll put words up there to like major spoiler warn you about it but i did really want to say something about haiko's character and after you find out what it is that's his goal and all of the stuff that's happening um and then you reach the heartbreak scene and this is where the major spoilers to explain his reaction and everything, when I said something about being on the brink and what it's like being on the brink, I feel like his character really was on the brink through this whole thing. I'm still trying to figure out exactly how much he did, how much of what he said was Nyan, how much really was Nyan, and how much was Haiku. The whole seven heads and all that stuff. It seems to me more likely within their character that that was on Nyan, like Haiku said. But then how did Haiku get the heads? He's going there and collect them all and, like, whatnot. Um, but, like, the whole field and his whole reaction there. And then when he comes back and the way he's acting. And, like, one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard <laughs> is when he's getting up and he says, give me a reason. I'm like, oh, the kind of character that it would have to take to say, give me a reason. He does not flip out. He doesn't try to kill everybody. He doesn't try to kill himself. He wants a reason. Give me a reason. And he listens. And even though he says, I don't care. And even the way he says that and all of that stuff. Like, there's so much in that scene. So many different things. Like, so many different things to think about. So many different things about the way he reacts and his reaction. And, the, and when he went, I am very confused why he spit up a bunch of blood. Where did that come from? When did he get injured like that? I do not understand what that was supposed to be. But even for some reason, just him spitting out blood. And it's like the vulnerability of Haika. He's so tough and so strong. And yet he's not. And it's like, this is what he went through in the past. And like... It's like all along, like the, the things that he has said to explain the others. And like, even when he said, you can't 
understand the mind of a crazy person or understand the logic of a crazy person. There's so many times when he was talking about Juri or Nyan, and it was like he was talking about himself, too. And this is why I say the rewatch value of it goes up once you find this stuff out, because you start listening to the things he's saying, the looks Hai Jung gives him in more than one place, the things she says to him, and the things he himself says, supposedly about Juri and Nyan, and it's like, it is about them, but it's also about himself, and even he knows it, and all of this stuff, and it's like, he's dropping all of these hints, and the funny thing is, I saw the ring on his finger, and I was like, Heka's not married, well, what's that ring? And like, for some reason... I don't know if it was the skillful in a way that they didn't show his hand during that part or something when they're filling out the postcards and Hai Jung says, there's no one for us to send it to. I should have been like, well, what about the ring on his finger? Where's his wife? How come we still haven't seen his wife? I did not clue in. And then when I did start cluing in, I'm like, really? You're going to deja vu it and give him and Yan the same story? But... The really interesting thing about it is that it's not exactly the same. But then the thing is that even when it happened, you really have to wonder, even right off the bat at the very first part there, how long did it take before Haiku started knowing that it wasn't Sheeling that did that? How long did it really take? How long did he actually legit believe that? And how much of it was more what he was saying about Juri, where it's like, perhaps even right from the beginning he knew, but he didn't care. He chose to latch on to that because that was the only thing that would keep him living. Like, especially in the fresh, raw moment of the whole shock of it all and stuff. It's like, what's going to keep you alive? And it's like... There's so many layers and so much depth to go through and think about and so many scenes and it's so powerful to me. It's just so well done. And then Hai Jung and everything with her. And the wolf. <laughs> you almost want to cry for a different reason when she's like, I'm leaving now. But this time it's not because you told me to. And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> the way he smiles and the way she smiles and turns and leaves, you're like, <laughs> <laughs> now I have to move into somebody made a comment on I think it was my drama list somebody made a comment about uh, the last see, uh, last episodes and somebody else is like put this behind a spoiler warning not everybody has seen it but I am warning I'm going to spoil you and tell you exactly what the last episodes are about because I want to get into the disappointing aspect of it because, okay, if you wanted to wrap it up and have a bit of the rain village in there, I suppose. I mean, if you're going to have the rain village in there, you have to have ten years in there. But this is why I say I feel like the author is just trying to bridge the gap and be gone with it and done with it and never come back here again. Because why else would he do it that way? Ten years later should have been a movie. That story really should have been a movie. And, like, part of the reason is, like, that is one of my favorite side stories. This, the whole story of 10 years later. I love that story because I adore Joe Han. He's one of the main characters in that story. It was nuts what they went through. There was parts about it I didn't like. They dragged certain things out and they brought in some stuff that was a little weird. But at the same time, it is connected. Even the weird stuff, it was connected to other stuff that they had already said. So it was not without... It was not outside of the lines. It was not outside of the realm of things that this drama, this story has set the precedence for before so it made sense even though it was kind of weird but that's eh, i'm not supposed to be talking about 10 years later per se but at the same time they gave you 10 years later so i am allowed to talk about 10 years later i really wish it had been a movie because i really wanted to see some of that craziness and like show on fatty in that one I think this is an element that you don't see in the dramas is fatty and Zhao Huan, what they're like in the books <laughs> together like Ah, I can't remember the exact quote, but it's because it's been a while since I've watched that one. I wouldn't be able to exact quote anyway because Xiao Hua swears. <laughs> At Fatty. <laughs> in the middle of everything and their guns and explosives and all this stuff because they're fighting monsters and all the rest of this. And it's like judging each other on how they're handling the situation. <laughs> anyway, I wish that one had been a movie simply because I wanted more of that part of it. I wanted the fuller, the journey to the tomb. Not just at the door. 
And see, here's a problem too. Somebody made the comment about being disappointed in, uh, there's the reunion. Chilene comes out from behind the bronze door and the comment basically said, and that's it? That's all? That's all they said? That it was so short, it was so disappointing and all this stuff. And I'm like, you know what? This is why it should have been a movie too, because this is my personal opinion. I could be wrong, but I feel like what happened was you who has never read the book don't understand the power of the simplicity and shortness and that's it of that scene because in the book you had practical chaos happening before that. It was loud and it was active and it was crazy and it was, ah, my gosh, can he even make it there? What is, yeah, like it's a whole adventure, a whole adventure to get to the door. I can't believe he actually showed the whole 10 different Ouija's from all these different whatever. He put that in there. The problem is, there was a lot of action and whatnot, but in the drama, because of the whole Yinxiao village part, they slowed down so much. Even though there was a bit of activity in there, they slowed way down for all of that. Because there was activity, and then there was a Yinxiao village where there's a whole lot of talking, and a whole lot of preparing, because everybody thinks they're all going to die, and it's really slow and quiet, and then there's a bit of activity, but it's really slow and quiet, and then there's a whole dun 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 dun, go to Sansi. Maybe if you go and watch Sansi before you watch the 10 years later episodes, maybe if you go watch Sansi and then come back here, maybe you'll understand the beauty of the simplicity. Because there was so much action and then you get down to it. And when you're reading the story, I'm telling you, like maybe not everybody would feel this way. But like even the author himself, he had, there was a note that he wrote that said when he was writing it, he wrote that and then he's like, he was expecting more. He thought there would be more. He was ready to write more. There was going to be more. But once he wrote it, that's all you need. That's all there's supposed to be. It, 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 anything else ruins the moment. And when you read the book, if you read that part of it, it's not a book. It's just a short story. If you read that short story and you get there, you understand and you get it. And you are so happy that he did it that way because it was so well done. In the drama, something about it didn't translate. And I think that could be at least part of why is because the whole thing already slowed down so much that you don't understand the importance of that moment being so quiet and so short and so simple. The last episode of this is The Rain Village. If you want to understand what happens between Sansi and Sound of Providence, you have to watch that episode because that gives you a little bit of a glimmer. Um how what happened to Ujie. See, this is something okay, there's two things if I can remember both of them. Um there is the whole aspect of, uh, I said before, you won't necessarily understand how he went from Sansi to, Uji, uh, to Sound of Providence because it's like in Sansi, he's like the tough guy and all this stuff. But then in Sa Sa Sound of Providence, it's like he doesn't even know how to fight anymore and he's totally missing stuff and whatever. And you're like, what? Rain Village gives you a glimpse of how that happened because there were several years there where they weren't doing anything. Um... Uh, so, like, he, he quieted down and he didn't have to be like that. He was finally be able to return to Rougier. Fatty said once, he's going to stay with him. He's going to be alongside him until the day that he can really be Rougier again. Because during Sansi, he's not being Rougier. He's not himself in Sansi. And it's like Sans Sound of Providence, Rain Village, all of this is victorious because he's finally able to be himself again. And all of this stuff. He's finally able to let go. One problem with that being... That in the beginning of this one, when he keeps saying to Fatty that he's missed stuff and the old me never would have missed this and all of that, I'm like, I can't remember if he was saying stuff like that in the book, but at the same time, it started to feel a little bit weirdly deja vu-y, because that's like exactly the same thing he was saying in Sound of Providence, and it's like, we had all of this stuff here, and then, well, why did you suddenly start missing it and all this stuff? You were focused on it this whole time. Why are you all of a sudden in Tibetan Sea, or sorry, Bronze Door, saying that you're missing stuff you never would have missed before? You're, you're implying that there was a bit of a, and there sort of was because it's been five years, but at the same time, was there really? Because he's like, oh, how could I have missed that? I shouldn't have been able to miss it, and I never will again. Oh, I should have noticed that, and now I can't go along because I'm too dumb to keep up, and I'm going to make everybody... Again, we did this twice. Okay, that was a little weird. And then the other thing, what was it? If I don't forget, 
There was one other important thing about that. Crap, I am forgetting it. <sighs> oh, the other weird aspect in the Rain Village was the fact that they brought up the Fish King. I'm like, why did the author do that? He's kind of, when it's movies, he's done that at the end of the names before. If you see the clip that this ending the name, he's hinted at another one of his stories. Just like, whet your appetite and make you curious and want you to go read the book. Or to like, you know, like I say, it's almost like more like Easter eggs and stuff. So I, in one sense, I get it because he's done that before, but he's never done that at the end of a drama. It's like you're wrapping it up and slowing everything down and making everything peaceful. Why did you bring up that much detail about the Fish King like you're literally about to go into it? Are you planning on making a movie about it? Like, I don't understand why at the end of a drama that's supposed to be closing the gap here, why it's a little bit... If you were going to do that, why weren't 10 years later in Rain Village, why weren't those both movies? Especially because they came after Sansi anyway, so they weren't part of closing the gap. The end of the Inshao village closed the gap. You closed the gap and then you went past it, and I don't know why. So, like, it did such a good job of bridging the gap, but then for some reason they threw that in there and made it like, the gap is now closed, we're gonna jump over here and put some stuff in here, and I'm like, if you were gonna do that, you should have just made some movies and made them longer and fuller. You should have made a movie about the ten years later, and you should have made a movie about the Rain Village and Fish King and all that stuff. So I don't quite understand how they did that, so that was weird. But at the same time, at least now it's on the TV. Uh, I mean, clearly they aren't going to make any more about it if they've already done that part about it, which is a little disappointing. Okay, the only other thing I wanted to say before I forget, which to me was actually really important, was the timeline of stuff. Because they're claiming that Tibet and Seaflower came five years after the end of the main series, which means in the ten-year gap, but well... Chiling is behind the bronze door. Five years of looking into research and trying to figure things out and not being able to find anything. And then finally, the whole of bronze door happens. There's only five years left. For some reason, I don't understand why, in the bronze door, they don't talk about the fact that Ujie goes and does a bunch of training with black glasses. And that is when he learns how to fight. He did not know how to properly fight and defend himself and stuff before that. He maybe picked up some of it and was learning some of it, and he wasn't completely 100% helpless, but even in ultimate note, when Fatty and Chi Ling and him are stuck in that cave, Fatty and Chi Ling both made the comment that their life was 10 times harder because they had to protect Wu Jie, because Wu Jie did not know how to protect himself. He was trying to keep up in the fight, but really, he does not know how to fight. And they got more injured. They got rather seriously injured because of Wu Jie. And he was like maybe trying to help them and whatnot. But he was actually making it worse for them. That's what he used to be like. And it was not until Black Glasses trained him that he stopped being like that. So all of that training with Black Glasses... All of the learning about the snakes and everything he can do with all of that. And all of the information he found out about that... There's a part of Sansi, there's actually four parts to it in the book, and for some reason, parts one, two, and three about Lee Su, and then part four goes back before Lee Su, and tells you a bunch of stuff that happened before Lee Su. All of that, which is an unfinished story, all of that, with already him starting to face off against the Wongs and all of this stuff, and then there's also the whole part about him being a reporter, which, how long did that last? He set up an identity as a reporter. I think that was at least a year as he was going and exploring the desert under this name, this alias that he had as a reporter. All of that, all of it, happened in five years? I thought all of that happened in more like seven years. I thought Tibetan Seaflower happened more like three years after the original series and all of the rest of the training and everything happened in seven years. Apparently not. Apparently Tibetan Sea Flower happens after five years, and all the rest of that happens in five years. So, I feel like that got a little bit messy. I feel like, in a way, there was more I wanted to say, but at the same time, I've taken 35, 34 minutes to say all that, so I should probably end here. So, I loved this drama from start to finish. There was plenty of things that I kind of didn't like about it, or was slightly disappointed about it. Most of the disappointment more had to do with, like, 
the, the first episode and the last two episodes, all the rest of it, I loved it. Except, I mean, the Inshaw Village was a little bit boring to me because, like I already told you, Haiko is my favorite character. And he's gone during that part. And I'm like, bring him back! Wrap that up! Because that was a... And, like, yeah, that whole storm thing and him suddenly vanishing and it showing her Haijun call for him. I don't quite understand. Is that supposed to be a symbolism of something? I don't know. That was odd. How did he completely vanish? And why would he completely vanish and leave her helplessly there, still stuck in the middle of everything? That's unlike him. Even though he doesn't claim to care about anything else, he does care about Haijun. So it's like... Uh, that was a little odd. But anyway, so... Wrap up of everything, that, I think, is my thoughts on all of that. And I'm sorry that it probably got really noisy because I didn't want to pause and wait for the stupid furnace to finish. Yeah, it's loud. So, <laughs> after all of that, can't blame me for talking so long about it because I really did love it. And there was so much stuff in it that was so good. Have you seen it before? Are you planning on watching it? Uh, did I make you want to watch it? Are you going to back up and watch all the other stuff if you hadn't? Are you going to go and read the books if you haven't? <laughs> so many questions. Feel free to leave any kind of comment that you want in the comment section below. And if you did enjoy this at all, please let me know. Because stupid YouTube and its stupid algorithms, I will keep on saying this, it claims that I have three views on the video and yet the average duration is still seven seconds long. If you did like it, please actually like it and or leave a comment so that I know that you did actually watch it. That was my all over the place thoughts. Crazy all over the place thoughts. Bye! Thanks for watching!